Welcome everyone, good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's seminar on the impacts of polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS as many of us know it, on environmental public health. My name is Nicole Dutra Marquez, and I'm a senior project coordinator for the National Environmental Health Association, and I will be moderating the seminar today. The agenda for today's seminar includes a quick overview of who is NEHA, where I will provide some insight to our organization and our role in environmental public health. Next, I will introduce our guest speaker and expert who will speak to you on the impacts of PFAS on environmental public health. Following the presentation, we will move into our panel discussion with three environmental health professionals who will share their experiences working in the field. Lastly, I will share with you information on NEHA's 86th Annual Education Conference. Allow me to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be uploaded onto the NEHA website, which is www.neha.org. We will take a few questions upon completion of our guest speaker's presentation and during the later panel discussion. Please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box during both. At the conclusion of the seminar, you will receive a link to take part in an evaluation where you will be able to provide feedback and comments on today's seminar. With that, let us begin today's seminar. Before we talk about who we are, I wanted to take a moment to talk about our profession. While many don't recognize it, environmental health is the foundation of public health. As you can see from the World Health Organization, nearly a quarter of deaths are due to a health risk in the environment. Environmental health refers to protecting humans from health risks, risks that come from the environment, such as pollution in the air, contamination of food at a restaurant, or lead in a water source. Environmental health is also one of the three legs in disease outbreak. It takes all three professions to prevent and reduce outbreaks to protect public health. As an association, everything we do is to build, sustain, and empower environmental health professionals so that they are equipped and prepared to protect the health of communities across the country. Our next recent, our most recent membership survey revealed that most of our members are working directly with communities at the local level. The survey also illustrated that our members serve all types of communities from very small to very large. This map illustrates the reach of our fiscal year 2022 projects throughout the country. We supported and partnered with jurisdictions on 768 projects. To support the workforce, we also invest in environmental health via funding from FDA and CDC on topics from food safety to land reuse. In fiscal year 2022, we invested nearly $10 million. Some examples of these investments are support for jurisdictions participating in the NEHA FDA Retail Flexible Funding Model Grant for Food Safety, scholarships for the Leadership Institute, funding for tribal entities and U.S. territories building their environmental health infrastructure, specifically around childhood lead exposure, disaster relief, and vector control issues, and health in all policies mini grants. Part of how we support public health overall and environmental public health specifically is by continuously providing training and education and offering credentials to certify the expertise of our workforce. In addition to our large online library of courses, webinar recordings, and resources, we host an educational conference every year that includes 14 different tracks from leadership to emergency response to bar the art to communication. This year, we will be in New Orleans. 
We have a team of instructional designers who build online and in-person trainings and instructors who deliver courses to provide the latest in research and practice to our workforce. We also provide field training in the Pacific Islands. We offer six credentials that certify expertise of all facets of environmental health, as well as specific aspects of food safety practice. We advocate for funding and policy at the federal level for the environmental public health profession specifically and public health generally. We also provide our members with regular updates on relevant national and state legislation through our webinars and blogs. We believe that part of building and sustaining our workforce is to provide opportunities for professional growth at many levels. We offer scholarships and internships to students studying environmental health sciences and the first ever Environmental Health Leadership Academy for professionals already working in the field. Much of our work is connecting the right people together and serving as a lead or support to set and meet goals that serve the profession and environmental public health. A few of our communities include the Private Water Network, Climate and Health Community, Concurrent Disasters Community of Practice, and the Environmental Health Strike Team Standard Community of Practice. For our members, we provide an online social platform we call Community. It all allows members to connect with each other, ask questions, and get tips. On the platform, we offer events like a quarterly 30-minute leadership presentation called Spark, and we're launching an Ask the Author pilot for members to ask questions and hear more from featured authors in the Journal of Environmental Health. We welcome anyone who would benefit from the research, education, advocacy, and connection we provide for the environmental public health community. You can learn more about all that we do at www.neha.org. Now let's get to our topic on the impacts of polyfluoral alcohol substances on environmental public health. I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Susan Burden, who is currently the PFOS Executive Lead for Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development, where she coordinates research efforts on PFAS. She is also a member of the EPA Council on PFAS. In addition to her PFAS responsibilities, Dr. Burden is the Scientific Support Advisor in ORD's Office of Science Advisor Policy and Engagement, where she provides leadership for OSAP on research planning and scientific support issues. Prior to this position, Dr. Burden served as the Chief of Regulatory Support Branch within OSAP and worked with a team of scientists to integrate ORD's scientific research and expertise into EPA regulations, guidance, and policies. Dr. Burden started her career at APA in 2010 as a Presidential Management Fellow after receiving a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from Carroll College and a PhD in Physical Chemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Borden, uh, the floor will be yours in just one moment. Just want to remind everyone to please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to drop any questions you may have for Dr. Borden, and we will address them after her presentation. All right, all yours, Dr. Borden. All right, great. Thank you, Nicole. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me just one moment. Okay. Can you see my screen, Nicole? Okay, let me see if I can advance. You see slides moving. No. Oh, challenges. Okay. Let me try this again. I'm back. <laughs> Zoom kicked me out. Okay, let me try this again and make sure that we can do this. All right, I see your screen. Okay. Movement. 
and it advanced to slide two. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. So thank you, Nicole, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today this webinar. Um, my name, again, is Susan Burden. I'm with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency of Research and Development, and I spend most of my time working on PFAS issues within the agency. So today I wanted to give you an overview of PFAS, um, both to talk about what PFAS are, why we care about them, and a little bit of information on what um, EPA is doing to address PFAS. So PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, and they are a class of chemicals. They're all synthetic chemicals, so they're man-made chemicals, and they feature chains of carbon atoms surrounded by fluorine atoms. And because I'm a chemist, I have to share and talk about chemical structures when I go ahead and talk about PFAS. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you see two chemical structures for the most well-studied PFAS, PFOA and PFOS. So as you can see, each of these substances has a chain of carbon atoms. We refer to this as the carbon backbone of the molecule. And in this case, all of those carbon atoms on that backbone are surrounded by fluorine atoms. So the green balls are fluorine in this case, and the gray balls are carbon. So for both PFOA and PFOS, you see these carbon backbones where you have those fluorine atoms surrounding the carbon backbone. In the case of PFOA, you have a carbo carboxylic acid functional group on one end of the molecule. And in the case of PFOS, you have a sulfonic acid um, functional group on one end of the molecule. So the kind of chemical structure that this is gives rise to a lot of desirable properties. So PFAS can be surface active molecules, meaning that if you put them in water, they will accumulate at the surface of water. And because they have fluorine in them, they have a lot of other useful properties. So they can be both water and oil repellent and they can also resist many degradation processes. So in particular, they can be resistant to heat. So they don't tend to break down with thermal processes. But PFAS is a larger class of chemicals than just PFOA and PFOS. So it's important to realize that there are other types of PFAS that are available or that can be used. So on this slide, you see some other examples of chemical structures that fall under the class of PFAS. On the left-hand side, we have perfluorinated examples. So in these depictions of chemical structures, we again have the carbon backbone that runs up the molecule, and you have um, fluorines located all around that carbon. So very similar to what you see when you see PFOA and PFOS. On the right-hand side of the slide, we have polyfluorinated compounds. So in a polyfluorinated molecule, you'll still have that carbon backbone. So for example, here in this 6,2-FTSA molecule, you have the carbon backbone that starts here at this point. It runs all along the, the molecule up to here. But in this case, you only have some of those carbons that are surrounded by fluorine atoms and you have some of those carbons that are not. So these first two carbons here, because they have no fluorines around them, they actually have hydrogen atoms around them. So for polyfluorinated molecules, you won't have all of those carbon atoms surrounded by fluorine atoms. Now, those properties that I talked about a minute ago um, give rise to a wide variety of uses for PFAS. So you can have PFAS that can be found in electronics and semiconductors, as well as other industries. PFAS can also be found in products that have stain resistance or water repellents on them. So thinking of carpets or furniture or water resistant clothing. You can also have um, PFAS included in food packaging. So if you think about a fast food wrapper and you think about wanting to make sure that the container that food is put into 
um, repels oil and water from that food to maintain the integrity of the container. That's another place that you might find PFAS. I want to spend a minute and um, actually highlight the firefighting foams. So PFAS are often associated with something called a triple F or aqueous film forming foams. Those foams have been used for decades to treat fires, mostly at military installations and airports. Um, and those foams have been used in both um, response to fires as well as fire training exercises. So those foams have been kind of widely sprayed onto the land surface as a result of that, which has led to sources of contamination in the environment. So one question is really how many PFAS exist within this class of compounds? There are different ways you can answer that question. One way to look at that question is by looking at how many PFAS are being used or manufactured in the United States. And we can get some information on that from the TSCA inventory or the Toxic Substances Control Act inventory. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you see a pie chart that um, indicates that there's roughly 1,200 PFAS within the TSCA inventory. Now, the TSCA inventory contains existing chemical substances that have been manufactured, processed, or imported in the United States. That inventory is kind of broken down into commercially active substances and commercially inactive substances. So within the PFAS part of the inventory, roughly half of those PFAS are commercially active and the other half are considered to be commercially inactive. So we don't have any information that suggests that those PFAS have been manufactured, processed, or imported into the U.S. in about a decade. Now, this is looking at the number of PFAS kind of through one specific lens. There are other ways that you can estimate the size of the class of substances. And some of those estimates um, include numbers in the kind of 10,000 range of different chemical structures that can fall within that big class of compounds called PFAS. As I mentioned before, PFAS um, are manufactured chemicals. So when we think about PFAS, we often think about and talk about the PFAS life cycle. So from the point of manufacturing those PFAS through their use in products, also all the way to waste management. So on the waste management side, you also have to be thinking about how you manage waste from those products that contain PFAS, but also how you manage waste that comes directly from the manufacturing process. At all parts of this life cycle, you have the potential for environmental releases. So you can have releases to the air from PFAS manufacturing, as well as potentially from incineration of PFAS containing materials. You can have PFAS releases to water resources, again, through um, PFAS manufacturing, but also just general use of PFAS products. So again, going back to the AFFF example, if you are discharging AFFF and that AFFF gets into a water resource, either surface water or groundwater, that's a direct release into into water. Um, you can also contaminate soil, again, as an example, through the discharge of AFFF. Now, I want to point out a couple of things about what can happen once PFAS get into the environment. PFAS are often referred to as forever chemicals because they resist a lot of those natural degradation processes, but that doesn't mean that PFAS can't transform in the environment. So you may have the release of one kind of PFAS into the environment, but you may have environmental conditions that allow that PFAS to transform from one specific chemical structure into another chemical structure that is still considered to be a PFAS. So what you might release to the environment may look different after some time in the environment. Once you have contamination in the environment, you also have activities that are associated with cleaning up that contamination. So that clean up, those cleanup activities um, generate waste in and of itself. 
And all of that waste needs to be managed as well. So really, why do people care about PFAS? And it really has to do with the fact that PFAS pose a risk to public health and the environment. So there's a growing body of scientific evidence that talks about the toxicity of some of these compounds to human health and ecosystems. Most notably, there has been a lot of work on the toxicity of PFOA and PFOS, and studies have shown potential reproductive, developmental, liver, immune, and thyroid effects, as well as increased risk of some cancers. We also know that PFAS can build up in animals and the environment. So even though you may be exposed to small concentrations of PFAS, those concentrations can build up in your body over time. We already highlighted the environmental persistence of these compounds and their ability to resist degradation because of those strong carbon fluorine bonds. <clears throat> so that's also a reason for concern. So again, even though you may have small quantities of PFAS discharged to the environment, over time, those PFAS can build up in the environment, leading to higher levels of exposure. And then we also know that there is known human exposure through contaminated water or contaminated food, as well as through interaction with consumer products, just to name a few. On the right-hand side, is um, some data on the average blood PFAS level. So given the uh, wide use of PFAS and their environmental persistence, most people have come into contact with PFAS and have some level of PFAS within their body. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have been monitoring certain PFAS in blood over time as part of their NHANES study. And so this data on this slide shows some of those blood concentrations over time. You can see decreases in the blood concentration for PFOS over time, but then you see kind of relatively constant numbers for some of the other PFAS with maybe a little bit of decrease for PFOA as well. So um, we in EPA are particularly concerned about PFAS because of the science that we see on human health and environmental effects, as well as knowing that exposures are happening. So EPA has been working to address PFAS. In October of 2021, we released the PFAS Strategic Roadmap, which presents EPA's whole of agency approach to protect public health and the environment from the impacts of PFAS. That approach is centered around five different principles. The first is to consider the life cycle of PFAS. So looking from um, the point of manufacture all the way through waste management of PFAS containing materials. The second is to get upstream of the problem. So um, in order to really reduce exposure to PFAS, one of the ways you can do that is by trying to prevent PFAS from entering into the environment in the first place. The third principle is to hold polluters accountable. The fourth is to ensure science-based decision making, which is where a lot of the work in the Office of Research and Development comes into play. And then the fourth is to prioritize the protection of disadvantaged communities to make sure that everybody has equitable access to solutions for um, addressing PFAS. Since October of 2021, the agency has been busy. We've proposed a couple of regulations focused on PFAS. We propose a national primary drinking water regulation for six different PFAS. That was an action that was taken most recently. Um, we also propose to designate two PFAS, PFOA and PFOS, as hazardous substances under the um, United States uh, Superfund law. We have um, put efforts in place to enhance PFAS chemical and drinking water data. So we're getting more and more information on PFAS toxicity, as well as occurrence information, particularly in drinking water supplies. We've begun to distribute money under the bipartisan infrastructure law to address emerging contaminants in water. PFAS falls under that umbrella of emerging contaminants. 
We've also worked to expand the scientific understanding of PFAS and translate that science into EPA's program efforts or policy efforts. And then we are also starting to use enforcement tools to identify and address PFAS releases. So the agency has a lot of activity going on all across the agency um, to address PFAS in the environment. So with that, I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer questions on some of EPA's activities as well as any questions you have about PFAS generally. So Susan, it looks like we have a couple questions here. Uh, did the research on the potential PFAS use the environment relevant concentration of PFAS? Yeah, so generally speaking, when we talk about um, toxicity studies, um, a lot of those studies are done on animals and those tend to be at higher concentrations. Susan, maybe try uh, stop sharing your screen. We lost... Uh, we lost uh, sound. Let's give her just a moment. I'm sorry. I, oh, you're you're fine. Technology, technology. I, I touch nothing no and all of a sudden it just ends. <laughs> no worries. All right. So um, where I think I got cut off was answering the question about um, whether or not the studies are being done on environmentally relevant concentrations. And um, Generally speaking, when we talk about toxicity studies, those may not always be at environmentally relevant concentrations. Um, but in, in other, another way to kind of think about this is that environmentally relevant concentrations can span a wide range, right? We have some, um, some places where drinking water can have a lot of PFAS in it. Um, so you can have high exposures, and then you can have places where you have very little or very low exposures. Um, so kind of managing that range of potential exposures, I think, um, can vary depending on what kind of study is being done. Wonderful. And another question for you, uh, for the organ systems like cardiovascular system, that were not on the list, does that mean that PFOS has no detectable effects on those organ systems? No, it does not necessarily mean that. So in some cases, um, it can be that there might be no data, or it could be that there is little data. Um, I think that it can vary depending on what also what specific PFAS that you're looking at as far as what endpoints have been looked at for that particular PFAS. Great, thank you. Another question for you, what is currently being done to address increased PFAS exposure? Um, so, EPA has, um, like I said, several several efforts underway. Um, we have been looking at kind of all of the authorities that we have under the environmental statutes to figure out how we can reduce exposure. So there are actions that can be taken on the regulatory side of things 
um, to reduce exposures, but there's also actions that can be taken, um, you know, kind of non-regulatory as well to reduce exposures. So I think in part, it really depends on the particular situation and what might be driving that risk and how you might address that risk. Great, thank you, Dr. Burden. Do we have any other questions? All right, we have one from Marilyn. Please explain the difference in EPA's regulatory efforts for PFAS in private versus public landfills. That is an interesting question. Um, right now, EPA's regulatory efforts on PFAS are not focused directly on landfills. Um, we have been focused most um, kind of primarily on trying to limit or reduce PFAS in drinking water. And we have not at this point taken regulatory steps on managing PFAS in landfills. That being said, we're doing, um, we do have research underway to try and better understand which PFAS are in landfills and how PFAS might be released from landfills. Um, mostly looking at permitted landfills, although there is an interest in looking at um, things that are not permitted landfills. Great. Another question for you. Um, has any research been done on PFAS in the sub-Saharan African region and its impact on her environment? That is a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Any other questions for Dr. Burden? All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Burden, so much for all the information you've shared with our participants today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Um, I will move on to our panel discussion with Jordan, Tim, and Michael. Uh, Dr. Jordan Bailey is a Michigan Department of Health and Human Services toxicologist and study director for the Michigan site of the CDC's PFAS multi-site health study, as well as several other state-led public health research initiatives involving environmental contaminants. She received her PhD specializing in neurotoxicology from Auburn University and completed postdoctoral training in neurotoxicology from Duke University's School of Medicine and in toxicology from Michigan State University's Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. She has published 17 scholarly peer-reviewed research articles in the field of toxicology and public policy. Her primary interest is in understanding the impact of environment chemicals on health. Our next panelist is Tim Watkins, joined, who joined North Carolina's Department of Environmental Quality as Chief Deputy Secretary in June of 2022. The Department of Environmental Quality accomplishes its mission to provide science-based environmental stewardship for the health and prosperity of the people living in North Carolina by administering regulatory and non-regulatory programs designed to protect and enhance the quality of North Carolina's air, water, and land. As Chief Deputy Secretary, Tim leads the operational aspects of an organization of over 1,400 professional staff located across the state. Tim, Tim joined the Department of Environmental Quality with over 30 years of experience in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where he most recently served as the director of the Center for Environmental Measurement and Modeling in the EPA's Office of Research and Development. Tim holds a master's degree in economics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a bachelor's in economics and mathematics from Rollins College. And our final panelist today is Dr. Uh, Mr. Michael Jury, uh, who started working in environmental health in 1977. 
Uh, Mike started to work on PFAS in 2016 and works with the Michigan PFAS Action Response Team as a regional team lead, project manager, and on multiple PFAS committees. In 2021, when he was promoted to the statewide PFAS specialist, he coordinates and provides technical expertise for PFAS through source identification, field investigations, sampling, and remediation. Mike participates in committee related to PFAS investigation and remediation techniques, coordinating with technical work groups regarding PFAS response. Mike also spent 20 years in the Air Force and Air National Guard in various specialties, including electronics, forward air control, and civil engineering. He retired as a senior master sergeant, sergeant, and he has degrees from the Community College of the Air Force, Delta College, and Central Michigan University. Now we will begin the panel discussion. And as a reminder, if you have any questions for the panelists, please also use the Q&A box to drop your questions in. All right, panel, um, who would like to share how you got started working with PFAS? I'm happy to, to jump in on that one. Um, so uh, for me, it was when I was working at EPA prior to, during, prior to um, the job that I'm currently in with North Carolina, uh, I was actually at a conference and I was mostly focused on um, air pollution monitoring and measurement um, at that time. And there was a presentation about um, an emerging source of um, contamination of PFAS through the air route of exposure, which I had not heard of before. I had heard of it in, in the water just about 10 years ago and um, was very intriguing. So I came back and I was in the Office of Research and Development at EPA and kind of started to um, develop a program looking at air fate and transport of PFAS. Great, thank you, Tim. Jordan, and would just, you like to share how you got started working yeah, with people? Yeah, Sorry, Mike. No, it's good. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so I, I started working with PFAS when I joined the Michigan Department of Health, um, and that was in, in 2018. And at that time, PFAS was just beginning to really start consuming a lot of a lot of time and resources at the state health department. And so I was able to sort of jump right in at that level, um, help with our response to sites of PFAS contamination. I really used my like broader background in environmental toxicology to sort of on the job, quickly get up to speed on what PFAS was and what its toxicity is, what its you know known mechanisms of action are, and really how to conduct you know risk assessments that are appropriate for understanding exposure to PFAS. Um, but really before joining the state health department, I had never worked with PFAS before. It's my origin. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Jordan. And Mike? In 2012, I had a geologist uh, give a presentation on emerging contaminants, and he mentioned this miracle chemical called PFAS. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. I bet I'll run into this thing sooner or later. And a few years later, uh, while working on contamination issues at a former Air Force facility in Michigan, we had uh, found uh, contamination in a drinking water well. And uh, we tested that drinking water well for PFAS, and lo and behold, uh, we started finding PFAS uh, outside the fence of the Air Force facility. It's a closed facility. So that started my work on PFAS. That uh, site was ground zero for PFAS in Michigan, and we currently have over 240 sites, official sites of PFAS contamination in Michigan, and we add them about four to six a month official sites, meaning they have groundwater contamination above state criteria. So I've uh, been working on it for quite a while, quite a while. Great, thank you, Mike. And what, uh, what are your current roles and responsibilities? And I'll go to Tim. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as in my current job at North Carolina DEQ, I'm uh, the chief deputy. So I kind of uh, manage the day-to-day -day operations and overall, um, you know, um, operations of the department in terms of HR facilities and budget. And there's a lot of PFAS related work in that regard, um, you know, from an HR perspective, making sure we get the right um, talent on board to help us address the issue. Um, we have a new brand new PFAS laboratory that's being installed with the latest equipment to help us analyze samples from across the state. 
Um, and from a budget perspective, kind of getting the resources we need uh, to address um, PFAS in our state, but maybe more importantly, there's significant amount of grant funding that um, Susan mentioned in her presentation, and uh, I'm helping to make the, kind of the operation and getting those those grant dollars into communities where they can take um, that funding and use it for PFAS treatment. And I'll just also mention, um, prior to, as I said, I was in part of EPA and I had the uh, privilege of serving on the EPA Council for PFAS when I was there. Um, and so we've um, established a similar council in our state department. Uh, it's called the, our, our PFAS Council. Um, and it, the reason why we're doing that is PFAS is, is a multimedia pollutant and it requires pretty much all hands on deck from across all the different aspects of our department. And so we really need to have that coordination between the folks who are doing air permits, water permits, uh, waste management permits, and all those types of things. So we're bringing that, that team together. So I lead that, uh, that council for our state. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Jordan, what would, how would you describe your current role and responsibilities? Yeah, so I work as an environmental toxicologist, and that means that some of my time is spent evaluating like new sites of PFAS contamination by determining what risk the public might experience if they were to be impacted by PFAS at that site. But for me right now, <clears throat> with the landscape of, of sort of work at the state health department, I'm mostly, I'm spending most of my time right now in our, in our research arm. And so I'm conducting and designing health studies that really seek to better understand PFAS's toxicity and like what exposure means for the health of people that that have been exposed to it, um, exposed to it specifically from their environment. And so I'm really responsible for all aspects of these research projects from the design to implementation to data analysis. Wonderful. And Mike, what how would you describe your current role and responsibilities? Uh, it varies every day of the week. Yeah, I, I think I know what I'm going to do when I walk into the door to my office and the phone rings and it changes. But as the PFAS specialist for Eagle and MPART, uh, one of the really great things I get to do is work with seven different state departments. Uh, Jordan's Outfit, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, is one of those great organizations. So trying to coordinate across different agencies, everything from agriculture, uh, health, uh, the DNR for wildlife. Uh, then we have LARA, which is our licensing and regulation, but that has as our state fire marshal. So working with the state fire marshal to try to get uh, Class B A triple F not used so much in the state and also to collect it. I help get investigations going. I help. Uh, one of the great things that we've done in Michigan is to make sure that all public drinking water sources have been sampled and continue to be sampled to make sure that public health is protected. Along with those public drinking water supplies, we also work with uh, DHHS and other agencies, uh, EGLE, to sample private drinking water supplies around sites of contamination. So I'm just kind of the jack of all trades guy. Uh, whatever needs to get done, I do. And uh, it it's always interesting. There's just a lot of interesting work uh, doing that, trying to figure out where has PFAS been used, for example, and then trying to figure out which industries we might find those and then work on trying to get investigations done. So as I said, we come up with new sites all the time. So it's a, it's a very interesting job. It's also exciting. So it's a great job, great time to be in the environmental field. Hey, thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's go to Tim. Tim, why do you why do you feel PFAS is 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 an important sector of environmental health? Well, yeah. You know, um, as Susan talked about the um, you know the chemical properties of PFAS have made it a very attractive chemical to be used in so many different products, and because of that, PFAS is everywhere in the environment. It's a very much of a multimedia pollutant that we're trying to. Um, mitigate and manage the exposures and risk to. So from an environmental health workforce perspective, it's it's uh, I think it's critical because it's something that we need to um, to focus on and to address. We need kind of a wide variety uh, and a wide range of expertise from across all the different disciplines within the environmental health professional field. And so I think it's absolutely critical for us to to be able to do that. And there's one other thing I'll just note is that 
one thing that we're really um, intrigued about uh, and thinking hard about in our state is um, trying to manage um, you know, important objectives like economic development, um, particularly in, in sources like clean energy, which are really important for our country. But we're finding that um, PFAS may be in those processes, right? Semiconductors, processing, and things like that. So we really need environmental health professionals to help us understand potential exposure and health effects um, uh, from, from those types of sources so that we can do responsible economic development. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Jordan, what what positive impacts or contributions have you made or your organization made um, in hopes uh, in, in the PFAS sector? Yeah, as well, so in my role as a, as a response toxicologist and as a researcher, I'm able to talk to a lot of people. So like I answer people's questions at least most of the time. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm talking to residents, I'm talking to research participants, and I'm I'm able to to provide people with information, context, and sometimes even advice related to their known or their potential exposure to PFAS. And I can listen to their concerns. And I I really think this is probably where I have the biggest direct impact for the general public. Although because of all the other activities I'm involved with, especially on the research side, I am also able to make some. I think. I would like to think meaningful contribution to the scientific literature. We publish, you know, primary science articles. We put out state release reports, and all of all of that um, documentation, those reports, those those peer reviewed manuscripts, they all um, are written with the hope that they're advancing the science on PFAS tox toxicity. And so, I I would like to think those are kind of the two main uh, arenas where I, I, I'm able to have a positive impact uh, in my role here at the the health department. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And Mike, what positive impacts or contributions have you or your organization made to the PFAS sector? Well, I'd like to think that the majority of the population in Michigan is drinking safe water. And so when you look at how many people are on municipal water and that we've tested all those water sources, and that is a huge accomplishment to have that many people now assured that the water they're drinking is safe and that the PFAS levels in that water are below state criteria. And uh, we're also looking at the new criteria that EPA has published. And fortunately, most of our water supplies are below that criteria too. So we are working to make sure that the public has safe drinking water. And the fact that they do I think is a major accomplishment. Not every state has gone out and tested every one of their public water supplies to see what's going on. They'll have to. Uh, the new UCMR will catch a lot of those systems, but I think for Michigan, that's a, a very big accomplishment to be able to say that public drinking water is safe when it comes to PFAS. And Tim, one of the things, Michigan is getting a battery plant to manufacture batteries for electric vehicles. And unfortunately, one of the chemicals in those batteries is a PFAS chemical. So we'll be looking at that and looking at that fate of that chemical in the manufacturing process. So even though it's something that we don't want used, uh, people still, because of its amazing properties, it still ends up getting used. So um, it's out there, it's out there everywhere. So whether it's food or water, or whatever, it's it's out there everywhere. Yes, it is. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Tim, what what would you wish for the environmental health students that are here with us today to take away from this online seminar? Um, I would I first of all just kind of get in a broader uh, understanding and appreciation for um, environmental health challenges that are posed by PFAS from a big picture standpoint, and then ultimately, hopefully, maybe enough to pique their interest in um, kind of choosing a career that will allow them to help us address this problem. Because as I've said a couple of times, this is an all hands on deck problem that we need, you know, more hands the better to address. So, um, and then, uh, you know, I would also note that, you know, PFAS the emerging chemical of today, but moving forward, we don't know what the next PFAS chemical might be. So just kind of building that skill set um, would allow them to, uh, um, uh, you know, continue to contribute um, for for a long, long and uh, productive career. 
Yes. Thank you very much, Tim. Jordan, what what are what would you wish for the students today to take away from the seminar? Yeah, I think it'd be it'd be great if if we can take away from this that that environmental health really does intersect with public health in really meaningful ways, and that there are a lot of opportunities for environmental health students in places like state health departments, which may not be on everyone's radars. I I feel like it might be kind of like in the shadows in some ways. Um, but but also that this is still an urgent, important, important work to be done, like Tim was just saying. I mean, there's still a lot to be done to better understand PFAS and to respond to PFAS in our environment. So there's a lot of work still to be done, for sure. For sure. Thank you. And Mike, how would you answer that question? What do you wish for the students today to take away? It's a great time for them to be in the environmental health field. There is this uh, field of PFAS is burgeoning. Uh, we find out more all the time. We find out uh, that it's in so many different media. So if you're a biologist, there's a lot of uh, need for uh, doing research, whether it be with fish, whether people, whether animals. Uh, if you're a chemist, we need a lot of chemists to go out and help us figure out the best way to sample this and then to analyze it. Geologist, fate and transport. I, I'm pretty sure whatever field you are interested in, we can find a spot for you doing PFAS. So uh, it is a burgeoning field with a lot of opportunity for students. And I would say, hey, if you have the ability to get an internship, whether it would be with a environmental department or public health department, go ahead and find out about it and get out there and get yourself an internship and see what's going on on the front lines of PFAS. And Great. I should make the sh unshameful plug that I do have an intern that's sponsored by NEHA and she's doing amazing work for me. Oh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> all right, and for all the attendees, if you have any questions for the panel panelists, uh, please use the Q&A box to go ahead and drop your questions in. It looks like right now we have a question uh, from Charlotte. What industry currently has the highest usage of PFOS and what measures are in place to mitigate them? Oh, well, okay. So um, the electronics industry certainly uses a lot of PFAS in making microchips and, the, and that sort of thing. Whether they're the top user or not, I'm not positive, but um, uh, platers used to use a lot of PFAS. They're not so much anymore. Uh, they're trying to use other things that are less... Uh, environmentally problem chemicals. So you know, that's such a hard question because if you look at a car, all the different things that go into making a car, all the different types of PFAS compounds. So you have all those. So I don't have the world's greatest answer. There are uh, papers out there that look at industries, but certainly it's used an awful lot in a lot of industries. Yes. Yeah, I would... I would just add that in terms for, for, for our state in North Carolina, we actually have a manufacturer of PFAS, right? So we have a, chem, a industrial facility that makes PFAS and that is um, by far our most significant source of PFAS. And it actually has forced our state to kind of be at the leading edge, at least, you know, in, in kind of managing and dealing with um, PFAS. So it's been um, for years, for example, they were um, putting PFAS into what, it's called the Cape Fear River Basin in our state. And um, and actually um, that that particular um, entity also, um, some of some of the folks on the on the phone may have heard of Gen X, which is a, a, a chemical that's received a lot of attention. They were the facility that made Gen X. And so um, to, to the po second part of the question, what's being done to mitigate? In that particular case, we we have a consent order with, with in the absence of federal regulation, we have a consent order with that facility to reduce and eliminate PFAS emissions into the into the river basin, um, and so um, we've been very aggressive on that front and um, are continuing to make strides to reduce um, exposures and in, uh, releases into the river in and exposures downriver um, from that facility. 
Great, thank you for sharing that. And it looks like we have another question. Uh, what has been one of the most rewarding projects or experiences of your career related to PFOS? And whoever would like to chime in on that. I can, I can start. Um, I, I've been able to get out in the field in communities where the entire community, hundreds or thousands of people in a number of cases have been impacted by PFAS. It's, it's affected them by their drinking water. And that is, that is a real, um, like meaningful event for people. People have a lot of questions. They're very concerned about their health. We, you know, we're able to tell them what's in their water, but at this point, there's not a lot of extrapolation that can be made to make like specific uh, recommendations for their unique health or like what's going to happen to them, that sort of stuff. And so what we're able to do with our research side is go out directly into those fields, into those communities, take blood samples from those folks and give them the information they're asking for directly. Like these residents are asking to know what's in their body, what's in their blood based, you know, as a result of their exposure to drinking water. And I'm able to give them those answers. So that's been particularly rewarding. They've asked for something very specific and we're able to deliver that very specific request you know, to them. And what's more is we're able to use, because so many people are involved in these projects, we're able to use those, those data to actually try and understand PFAS overall better and what it means to people's health at a you know, population level. So that's been particularly rewarding for me. And all that work is still ongoing. It's in its early inf infant stages in some projects and it's a little bit farther along than others, but there's still a lot to do on that front. That sounds like an amazing project. Yes, very much. Uh, Tim or Mike? Uh, the Drinking Water Project has been uh, just a really great thing to be able to do that. We're also doing surface water and fish samples, which I think are important. Also, I would say the work I did around the former Air Force facility in Michigan, attempting to figure out the nature and extent of the contamination. Uh, as we did more work, we found out that more AFFF had been used in the community and to be able to find those sources and try to start to define those sources, that was a very rewarding thing to be able to tell the community, okay, we're here, we're gonna figure out where this stuff is going. And we still are working on that because we have not figured out every place around that area it's gone. So, uh, and one of uh, Jordan's studies is dealing with that community around that Air Force facility, which I know has brought a lot of people uh, a better understanding of what they might be going to be exposed to. And it also has provided some certainty, hey, the state cares and somebody's gonna look into our problems. I've heard a lot of people say, finally, they're paying attention to us. Wow, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for such an inspiring panel discussion, uh, Mike, Jordan, and Tim. Uh, we really, truly appreciate that. Um, we will go ahead and uh, close out here. Uh, just a couple last things. Um, this year, uh, NEHA is hosting our 86th annual educational conference in New Orleans, Louisiana, July 31st through August 3rd. The theme is raise the voice of your environmental health workforce. Uh, early bird registration is still open. Uh, the conference provides a unique opportunity to network with hundreds of environmental health professionals and those just beginning their careers in environmental health. Uh, you can find more details on how to register at neha.org forward slash AEC. And let me just share that at the AEC, our keynote speakers are going to be Maureen Leckfield and retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore. And I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Susan Burden, and our panelists, uh, Michael Jury, Dr. Jordan Bailey, and Tim Watkins, for partnering with NEHA and providing great content to all of our attendees. And thank you all for attending today's seminar on the impacts of polyfluoroalkyl substances on environmental public health. 
please complete the evaluation that you will receive the link for for today's seminar. We would greatly appreciate your feedback, your comments, and recommendations. And please feel free to contact us anytime by visiting our website at neha.org. And uh, we are going to drop an email address and phone number in the chat box if you would like to reach out with any questions for any of us. Thank you again, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.